This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our study in the book of Revelation in chapter 2, verse 20. Now before we begin, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins. At the same time, we're allowing the Spirit who indwells us to control us. We want His control and not the sin nature's control. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and the privilege and everything you provided so we can study your word. We ask now that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive that word. In Jesus' name, amen. You might wonder sometimes if you have never run across a study with me when I talked about the heart and mind. The heart is the term that the ancients used for the center of a person. It included not only his seat of what they would call physical, spiritual, but also mental life. And I put mind in there just as well to make sure you understand it's the mental processes there as well. So we say both heart and mind. So we want our entire selves learning. That includes our emotion as well. Well, let's begin by going back to the beginning of this particular letter to Thyatira. Verse 18, and to the messenger of the church in Thyatira write, these things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith, and service and perseverance, and that your last works are greater than the first. Well, this is somewhat all approval, isn't it? These are good things. We spent some time on these last time. Now we come to the part of what's disapproved. Remember, Christ is evaluating the church. What is disapproved? And this is a pretty interesting passage. I say that because it has a lot of what you might say variety to it. Very colorful. But I have this against you that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and deceives my slaves to commit sexual immorality and to eat food sacrifice to idols. Notice he says, my slaves. Does that remind you who's speaking here? It's Jesus Christ. Yes, John's writing it, but he's simply transmitting what the Lord has given him to write. Remember, to the angel, uh, to John, to the messenger, and then it gets read to the people. Well, here's what was read. It begins by saying, but that's a strong contrast with what we just saw with what was approved. I have this against you, that you tolerate. Let's talk about this word tolerate. Now, we kind of know what it know, uh, means in English, right? Well, that's basically what it means in the Greek as well. But let me expand on that just a moment. The word is afi amy. I'm having a little trouble getting on the board. Here we go. To release from moral obligation or consequence, to allow to go on. So you're letting it go on, even though it may be immoral or no kind of consequence to it. You're going to let them do it. It may include leaving it for someone else to do something about it. So we kind of understand it that way, don't we? Let's talk about Jezebel. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, this is one of the more famous stories that involves Ahab, her husband, and evil Jezebel. Notice how it puts it, that woman Jezebel. So they have someone that they're tolerating that's something like Jezebel. And this recalls the Jezebel of 1 Kings. She was a Canaanite who married Ahab, 874 to 853 B.C., he was king of the northern kingdom of Israel. She sought to take the people into the worship of Baal and Asherah, idolatry and sorcery. Yes, she had a whole lot of uh, junk to pile on the people of Israel, 2 Kings 9.22. She also had charge over a large number of prophets, 1 Kings 18.19, and tried to kill God's true prophets, 1 Kings 18.13. So this woman was really a wicked, wicked woman. 
Here the name is used to describe, that is in our passage, a wicked woman in Thyatira who called herself a prophetess. She is a self-proclaiming prophet. Earlier we saw self-proclaimed apostles back in 2.2. This also makes her a leading teacher in the church. People are following her. Since she does call herself a prophetess, her teaching would have likely been an imitation of prophetic pronouncements and oracles. So she's playing the game. She's put on the show, putting on the show, claiming she had a word from God, or God just told her to say this or that. So many people fall for that. God just told me to tell you. Today, if you put her in a church, whether it be charismatic or even a dull church, she would sound exciting. She'd be fun to hear. But she's a false prophet who, like many in our day, mislead people by the groves. Now, we don't have the evil woman's name. We don't need it. She's identified. We have something of her character and what she does. So John here is speaking of her type of character, I should say writing about her type of character and her activities. But she's like the old Jezebel. Remember, this is the Lord's judgment on her. This is how the Lord is evaluating her. We mustn't forget, and this is easy to do, that these are the words of Jesus through John. All right? He's doing the evaluation. The problem is that some have accepted her as a prophetess and her teaching and the activities she was promoting. The old Jezebel was known for leading Israel away from God through sexual immorality, 2 Kings 9.22. So this Jezebel, notice what it says, and by teaching deceives. And she teaches and deceives. Planao. Here's our word here, planao, to mislead, to lead astray. Simple word, simple understanding to this word. She teaches my slaves, that's our word doulos again. We spent some time on that. These are Christ's dedicated servants to him. They have sold themselves over to Christ. That's what we should all be. Now what's sad is, if not shocking, that these are believers who turn to follow Christ seriously and are now deceived. Her teaching is what misleads the people. Now, folks, that tells us something. Anybody can be misled, no matter how dedicated you are to Christ. The people that are least likely to ever be misled are those who have grown to maturity and have a great deal of discernment. But your amount of dedication doesn't mean you're not going to be misled. You say, well, how could the Lord let that happen to me? Because he tells you in his word, you need to grow and develop discernment. So you say he's letting it happen to you. It doesn't have to. He wants you to take your free will and apply it to growing spiritually so you can make the right decisions. But notice how she misleads people. She used her teaching. It was probably well received by many people. Wow, she really sounds like she knows what she's talking about. And listen to her voice and her tone and the way she does this. Well, she's pleasant to listen to. Let's just sit down here and hear what she has to say. Well, that sounds okay. Well, that's a little off, but let's hear what else she has to say. So you continue to fall into that trap. Notice what she's teaching. She deceives my slaves into committing sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Now you wonder, how can Christians fall for that? Just keep listening. Let me explain here. The meat that they eat was sacrificed to the idols, then they shared it at the banquets. In many cases, as we've talked about, they had these guild banquets. In other words, your, your uh, particular union group met. I use that in a a sense that this is where uh, your fellow skilled workers met. There's the plumbers plumbers union, the carpenters union, the masons union, that is the bricklayers union, that type of thing. 
and remember again the background of the trade guilds, and to keep one's livelihood, one would be expected to attend their pagan festivals and participate in their activities that included both the eating of the idle food and sexual immorality. Jezebel taught that it was all right to do this. And it's no wonder that some Christians might have tolerated this woman. That was an attractive feature. You mean she teaches you can be a Christian and still do these things? Oh, yeah. You got to listen to her. She's pretty deep. So her teaching fits their desire to keep their jobs and business in good standing with the pagan community. So they're free to indulge in idolatry and eating the meat, even sexual immorality. Now, it's one thing to have it out in society, as destructive as it is to families and society, but in no way should it be allowed or taught in the assembly church. The church is to be protected from this sin and evil, and believers are to be taught the biblical perspective on it. If the church is already involved in it, there needs to be a quick correction. Let's put a short application up here. I'll do that now and then. Make sure you're on the same page with me. Believers who consider themselves very dedicated to Christ as slaves can be deceived by false teachers. So let me put it this way. Even you can be deceived. I know that I have in various ways. Sometimes they got me way off. But I was young, I was naive, I was gullible. But I must also tell you, I was really hungry for truth. The devil often uses that to throw some, uh, what should I say, you're hungry, you're starving, he throws a pail of false teaching in front of you. Now, it may be that she twisted the teaching of Paul when he taught on idle meat back in 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 8. That's a little complicated. You might want to go back to the series to hear that. Back there, Paul said there was nothing to idols. All right, they're nothing. They're just a piece of wood, basically. So you can eat the meat, but don't get involved in the idol worship. So if you buy the meat in the market, don't worry about it. Take it on home and eat it. Someone's there. They know what happened to be idol meat and they're a young naive Christian and they may think that it's okay to worship that idol since you're eating the meat don't do it that's an act of love so be careful about who you have dinner with <laughs> all right let's look at the correction in verse 21 I have given her time re to repent but she is not willing to repent of her sexual immorality. So this is the correction. It begins by saying, I have given her time to repent. Note, this is important. I have given her time. The Lord has given them time. She's talking about her in particular. She's the leader. If he can get her to turn around, if she'll turn around, maybe the others will follow. The length of time for repentance is not stated, but she, the Lord himself says she has been given time to repent, to confess and stop what she is doing. But here's what's happened. But she is not willing to repent of her sexual immorality. She was leading them, teaching them, deceiving them, and involving herself in the sexual immorality. She didn't want to stop either. And there are such a number of people, or they're at a level of sexual immorality going on in the church, that divine discipline by the Lord is coming. So the church itself is going to get some discipline for not dealing with this. They may even lose it. The discipline will also come to her followers. Verse 22, Behold, I will throw her on a sickbed, onto a sickbed, 
and those who commit adultery with her into great suffering unless they repent of, notice, her works. We have the word behold. You probably noticed I like to use the word behold. Others will say listen or pay attention, something like that. But the old word that you often see in maybe the King James, it really is an attention getter because people don't use it too much. Behold, right? Well, it does mean look or pay attention. It means focus on what is happening right now. What's going to happen? The Lord says, I will throw her onto a sick bed. <laughs> a sick bed? Well, that's just what it sounds like. It's a bed. The word is cliné. Cliné. A bed afflicted with disease, a lingering illness. The place of the sexual sin now becomes the place of judgment and discipline. But she is not alone on that sick bed. But notice the discipline comes to her first. Jezebel, the false teacher, and then... The verse continues, and those who commit adultery with her. Let's talk about the word adultery for a moment. Adultery is a rather simple word to understand. It's when a married person is involved with another person that is not their spouse. So this could be married people getting involved with uh, a bunch of um, people involved in the idol worship. Or it could be an idol worship person himself or herself who's already married. So you can have all sorts of combinations here, right? Married with married, married with unmarried, and so on. In this immoral practice. But notice what's happening. I will throw her into onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great suffering. Now, this is a word we should be very familiar with, and we're going to see it a lot more in this book. It's the word flipsis again. The basic meaning, let me expand on the meaning here. The basic meaning is to press together. It means pressure. Well, when you suffer, you have pressure, right? Whether it be illness or uh, somebody in the family or at work. The word also means affliction, distress, and, of course, tribulation. This great suffering could mean emotional, physical, psychological, and mental issues, not just physical. Something that seriously affects one. Sexually immoral, immoral people have uh, physical issues. At times, they catch diseases. So keep in mind, this word also means tribulation. So again, it's easy to project this meaning and the term itself into the future time of tribulation to those who are alive in those days, the period before our Lord returns. But there is a way out of this suffering. Last line, unless they repent of her works. Notice the her works. She's the one that's getting them involved and they're sharing in them. The word is our common the word for works is our common word ergon here. The term basically was used as we use it, sometimes used in a bad sense or good. Good works or bad works. Ergon, actually pronounced ergon, it's a long O. Um, uh, it actually is the uh, that's the genitive form. We often hear me say erga, something like that. That's a neuter. Uh, that's a neuter. Uh, but we've learned this term is used for a variety of activities, and here we see immoral activities. Here it's bad, sinful work, or deed, sometimes it's translated. Now, it's reasonable to ask if this is some form of spiritual adultery as well, because that is such a common theme back in the Old Testament. Or is it literal sexual immorality? Well, it is at least physical, if not also spiritual adultery. One can say that, but that's not the intention in this particular passage. Certainly some of the church are following another path other than Christ, committing spiritual adultery, but that's not what it's addressing here. These are really pagan sexual uh, activities. 
Now, like the previous letter or letters, there's the potential of divine discipline in these folks' lifetime uh, in their immediate future if there's not some turnaround. But also, there's application for the distant future for the next generations of churches who fall into this pattern all the way up until the time before Christ returns into the tribulation. Either way, there's an imminency of judgment, or it's imminent. That's probably the best way to say it. I'm not sure imminency is a, a word, but basically it means it could happen any time. Okay? Uh, that's present. It could happen. The consequences of discipline get worse. Notice, as we follow this trail along, this is what happens if there's no repentance. And I will strike her children with a deadly disease, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you according to to your deeds. We begin with, and I will strike. This is a term that, well, it can mean strike to the point of killing. And that's what it means here. Apoctino, to kill in some way. It could be a disease, a, a big plague of some sort, as some translations indicate. Whatever it is, it is deadly. Now, it's on a bed, so it seems that it's probably some sort of bad disease. And notice it says, I will strike her children, that's her followers, her disciples, with a deadly disease. Now, the word in the Greek here is just death. But since she's being struck, it's on the bed. Um, we have the word um, dead here. What strikes somebody on the dead is usually a deadly disease. So that's why I translate it. So I, it, I'm, I'm not just putting it, and I will strike her children dead. There's some sort of disease here from all appearances. Now, for those who are Christians who die here, this would be the sin unto death, the most severe discipline that a believer can undergo. And this severe discipline would be a warning to all the churches. As it says, and all the churches will know. That would be those in Asia first. And as the word got out among the churches throughout uh, Christianity. And here's what they're going to know. That I am he who searches... The word is minds, nephos. We talked about minds earlier. The word actually means kidney, but it relates to the inner person, as I mentioned earlier, down in the uh, torso per portion. This would be the lower portion. Um, you know, I sometimes think how people's emotions get really upset and they get sick of their stomach. Well, they interpret that as it's 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 where your thinking is as well your your emotions are they're down there the other term and we've seen this many times is cardia now cardia as i said earlier this is the center person center of a person his seat of life the center of life his thinking emotion uh, his thinking and well his mind would be here too as well We've studied this graph many times. But at any rate, this is the whole inner person. This is what this is saying. This is the entire inner person. I, I search the entire inner person. What you're feeling, what you're thinking, what you want to do, that type of thing. And then it says, I will give to each of you according to your deeds. That's the same word we've seen for works. Your works manifest what your thinking is, what's going on on the inside. As so, the church of Thyatira will be an example to all the churches. Christ knows what's going on in churches all around. He knows the hearts and minds of the people. He searches those minds and hearts, our motives, our intentions, our mental attitudes, 
with those blazing eyes and feet of burnished bronze, a standpoint of purity. And he says, and I will give to each of you according to your deeds. So people are going to be evaluated based upon what they do, which reflects what they think. And let's not forget what started this. It was a lack of doctrinal purity, which led to heretical teaching and immoral activity. It's a common pattern. When there's wrong teaching or little teaching or no teaching in a church, Christians go about their way thinking everything's well and good. Well, they're doing it, I'm doing it, right? Now, they've already been noted as being a loving, serving church as a whole. But you see, they have this deadly virus within them in the form of false teaching from perhaps one of the most popular teachers in the church. And it spread into their works, their activity, idolatrous sexual immorality. And this is a major reason the church much must teach sound doctrine and plenty of it. That heretical teaching must be stopped and dealt with seriously by often the leadership or faithful believers or both, of course. Otherwise, you have a possibility of many people in that church dying the sin and the death, or even worse, as well as the loss of the lampstand. When you come to verse 24, we come to more words for the faithful. But I say to you, the rest who are in Tyra, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned the deep things of Satan, as they say, I place on you no other burden. This is a difficult verse. I think it's often misinterpreted. I'll explain. The first clause is actually easy, but I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold of this teaching, those who do not practice or hold to the teaching of Jezebel. Okay. Then the Lord describes them. And in describing them, he helps describe those who do hold to the teaching. Because the rest here are the ones who are not doing this. Here it is who have not learned the deep things of Satan, as they say. Now, this is interesting. They would be those who hold to the deep things of Satan. Well, it's hard to believe that a Christian would say that. But you see, when you think you're in a special group, and it's cult-like, thinking gets rather contorted. But some who were deep into this false teaching believe that they have learned things about Satan's methods and ways that only the deepest student and adherent of Jezebel's teaching learn. So we're a special group. We've learned to get around Satan's methods. So they found ways to indulge in idol worship and activity, including sexual immorality that makes them as if they are not guilty before God. Jesus is saying, remember, he's the one that's having this written. There are some who have not learned this stuff, these deep things of Satan, as they say, as they call them. Then Jesus says to them, I place on you no other burden. Now, Notice the comma at the end of this verse. This is a way of saying, and we do it ourselves, uh, uh, you know, that's all I got for you except this. Right? This is what this is, this is doing too. You're doing fine on this issue about staying away from the false teaching. You're avoiding all that stuff, not getting caught up into that movement. But the next Greek word keeps the thought going in the next verse. Only, only what you have, hold fast until I come. The word only marks something added in contrast that one needs to consider. Only what you have, that's we've seen already, their love, their faith, their service, their perseverance, avoiding the heresies and their practices. Hold fast, there's our word krateo, 
seen this word several times, hold with a grip. For how long? Until I come. That would include the Lord's coming visit, if that's necessary, for judgment. It would also look forward to the second coming. The very end of this letter is reversed here, perhaps because of the severity of the letter. We talk about the potential for blessing. From verse 26 to 28, we talk about reward. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, I will give authority over the nations. And he will shepherd them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, just as I have received the right to rule from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. The one who conquers, that's the one who keeps on conquering, being victorious, overcoming the world, Satan, not falling for the heresies. And who keeps my works, he keeps doing the right thing. We just saw that, uh, the perseverance, the love, the, the service, and so on, producing good until the end, till Christ returns. So that identifies what we've basically just described. That person, that person. Christ says, I will give authority over the nations. A major part of Christ's rewards as a share in ruling over the nations in Christ's kingdom. We studied something of our uh, kingship back in uh, 1-6, if you call that, with the priesthood. Now we're going to go into a little more detail. Now we usually see this type of ruling that we just see described regarding Christ. But here the point is made clear that the authority to rule is shared. This authority to rule is shared with the victorious saint. The idea includes both ruler and judge. A couple of verses will remind you of these while we're warming up to this. Blessed are the gentle, some of your older translations say meek, for they will inherit the earth. Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? He was challenging them to settle issues in the church. The reward for the obedient victor up to the end is a place in authority of authority over the Gentile nations. That's the word nations. Uh, we see this in 1.6, 3.21, 26, 1 Corinthians 6.2 about ruling. Keep in mind that this is talking about individual rewarded believers. There's some of your reward believer who's faithful. It is ruling over the nations. Verse 27, he will shepherd them with the rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. Now, before we break this down and look at in a little more detail, let's look at where this near quote comes from. It comes from Psalm 2.9, and it looks forward to Christ ruling, but we need to look at it in some of its own context. So we're going to go back and look at Psalm 2, 7-9. I filled in here to tell you who's talking. The king of Israel says, I will surely tell the decree of the Lord. That's the word, Yahweh. He said to me, you are my son. Notice the capital letters. I myself today have fathered you. Ask from me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them as a clay vessel of a potter, in other words, a clay pot, right? First things we should see in verse 7 is the Lord declaring the king, his son, you are my son. So if I get that back up there for you, okay? You are my son. This links back to the beginning of this letter to Thyatira. Remember that? 
What was at the beginning of the letter? Well, we'll have to bring this up to see it. This is back at the beginning of this letter. And in the message of the church in Thyatira, these words of the Son of God. There's the Son again, mentioned back in, we just saw back in, two, in uh, uh, Psalm 2-7. Then we have our near quote when it says here in the psalm it says you shall break them with the rod of iron we have that in verse 27 you shall shatter them as a clay vessel of potter so originally this was referring to the future role of christ over his kingdom on earth the millennial kingdom now go back to our revelation passage in verse 27 we are in the context of a conquering believer who's going to rule. And then this Old Testament verse is brought into the picture in verse 27. Now listen. The conquering ruling believer is promised that he will share in what we read in verse 27. Verse 27 reads, And he will shepherd them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. Now, we've often heard about the believer sharing in the rule as a king. Now we're talking about some of the, uh, we might call methods or techniques that he's going to use. He will shepherd. Let's talk about that word for a moment. It basically is the word we usually translate shepherd to tend sheep, to watch over people. Uh, poimino is the word just to confirm that for you. And he's going to shepherd them with a rod. Now, we've seen shepherds with their staff, and we've heard of their rods many times. The word is rhabdos. Let's talk about some of these terms for a moment. In fact, I'm going to put the other two terms up there. The word for rod, rhabdos, from a staff shape or royal scepter to a club. So it can range. And notice it's of iron, Sidi, sidir, uh, sidireos. I don't think I've ever pronounced that word out loud before. But this is a club with a steel cap to harden it on the end to give devastating, even deadly blows to the target. All three terms, shepherd, rod, and iron, are used again in Revelation 12, 5 and 19, 15. So this is a weapon-like tool or implement for enforcement, which is figurative, for a very firm or most rigorous rule. A shepherd might use a, a, a strong uh, rod like this to, to fight off the wolves, maybe to uh, tap a sheep to get back in the line. But here it indicates severe force. And this is an illustration. Listen to the illustration with it as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. So it's going to be used enough to break an earthen pot. So there's force. In Psalm 2, from which the imagery is drawn, it is the opposing nations who rage against the Lord's anointed. He breaks and shatters them like earthen clay pots to bring them under his rule. So there is a firm rule here. This pictures the conquering believer as both ruler and judge, there to help with the Lord, help the Lord bring the nations into line in the establishment of his kingdom on earth. Though we will see this in much more detail at some uh, point after the beginning of the second coming and his second and his angels rather calling up believers, they will join him in the ruling over the earth. They will help the Lord in maintaining Christ's rule on earth during his thousand-year reign. Jesus continues to speak about this rule. Verse 28, just as I have received the right to rule. That's an insert, but that's just to explain the verse. From my Father, and I will give him the morning star. Here we see another reward. It begins, just as I received, just as Christ received the right to rule. That's the authority or imply, as implied in the context, from the Father. So follow the process. God the Father gives the authority to the Son. The Son gives the authority to conquering believers as reward. And they will 
rule, and judge. And this carries over, this process carries over into the next gift, and I will give him the morning star. Now, the morning star is a symbol of Christ's messianic rule. It starts with the resurrection. He rises. He's exalted to the right hand, and then he comes back to the earth. The point is that Christ rules and shares his rule and judgment capacity with the conquering believer. So also Christ will share the morning star with that conquering believer. You know the morning star is Venus. Venus in modern times uh, is really considered a planet. It's the brightest in the morning. You might even say the brightest star in the morning. It's brighter than both, let's put it that way. As such, it was revered by the ancients who sometimes applied its image to glorious rulers. Isaiah 14, 12. The only part of that which is carried over, though, to this morning star we're talking about is its brightness or glory. It outdoes them all. Though Jesus is called the morning star later in Revelation 22, 16, in this context, he has given it so he is seen as unequaled among all the stars. This also alludes back to one of Balaam's prophecies. A star will come out of Jacob, Numbers 24, 17. The morning star with its light and glory are, are awarded to every victorious believer because of his stand for truth. Interesting verses, Daniel 12, 3, compare that with Matthew 13, 43. He will be a shining light into the world. In addition, the star is a symbol of royalty in Scripture, Matthew 2, 2. So you have all these ideas behind this of Christ being a morning star and then believers share it. It's what comes to victorious believers in Christ's church who continue to grow in their faith and love and service and endurance on to spiritual maturity on into the kingdom. So the victorious believer receives this morning star awarded by our Lord Jesus Christ himself to share his rule and to some degree his glory. He allows us to share his glory. Finally, verse 29, the challenge to hear and overcome. He who has an ear had better hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This one's short and sweet. We know it by now. As in the three previous letters, this warning preceded the reward portion rather than ending the letter. There is no clear reason for this difference, but like every church, they all share this warning. Let's go back, and I'd like to read just the last several verses, uh, back to 24, where we start talking about who's going to get this. But I say to you, the rest are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned the deep things of Satan, as they say, I place on you no other burden, only what you have, hold fast until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, I will give authority over the nations, and he will shepherd them with the rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, just as I have received the right to rule from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear had better hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, we, carried, we covered a lot of material there. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word today. It's been a challenge. Lord, we look forward to not only the challenges we have in this life, but to the reward that you give your slaves. Thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.